and I brought that one a couple of times, the Hebrew culture. You, for you to understand Hebrew and the translations of the Bible, you have to know it's very necessary that you know these things or else you're going to miss the ball. Simple as that. You just won't catch the ball. Uh, you have to do that. If you didn't know Hebrew, how would you translate John 1 and 1? It would be a total mystery, wouldn't it? Because John 1 and 1 is a Hebrewism. And uh, so much of the New Testament, you, how many of you have read the book of Hebrews in the New Testament? How many of you read it from Greek? It's different. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. The writer of the book of Hebrews did not know Hebrew. Many people say, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Many people say Paul wrote it. Paul knew Hebrew. Paul didn't write that book. There's too many mistakes, Hebrew mistakes in it otherwise. And I'm not saying it's not inspired. It's absolutely inspired of God. But the writer of Hebrews, God uses every writer, doesn't he? When we have, we've got how many writers in the New Testament? How many people wrote the New Testament? How many? A few men? No. It was written over approximately 1,500 years in period of time, 1,500 to 2,000 years altogether. Many of the writers didn't know each, know each other at all. There's about 40 different writers of the New Testament according to who you might say wrote which book. And uh, the book of Hebrews is written by a, uh, a very educated Greek writer. Very educated, highly educated in the classics. The book of Hebrews is the most, the, the greatest New Testament example of classical Greek. We have, period. It's like it's written in classical Greek. Most scholars now believe that Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews. Apollos, the guy in the book of Acts. Apollos uh, was a, um, what we call a Hellenistic Jew. And the Hellenistic Jews had a different idea of the tabernacle and things than the Hebrew Jews. And the book of Hebrews is not a Hebrew Jew. That's a Hellenistic Jew that wrote that. So that we tell that. And we study that. A lot of it is from the tabernacle there. And you will see different. Uh, up here we have the tabernacle up here. You see how it is there? The, the Hellenistic Jews put the, the altar of incense in the Holy of Holies. The regular Hebrews did not, and the writer of the book of Hebrews puts the altar of incense in the Holy of Holies. So what do we have? Does that answer some questions? How many of you knew that? Did anybody know that? Okay, that's some of the, what we call, we take biblical, we, we look, we, it's what you call biblical criticism, but it's not, there is biblical criticism which that tries to prove that the Bible is wrong, but there are people in theological circles, what you call biblical criticism, they take everything in, the, in the, the New and the Old Testament and they look at it with a microscope and try to find out who wrote this and why they wrote this in this way. And that's not what we call trying to deny the Bible, but we have an in-depth study of that and that is one of the things I brought to you from the book of Hebrews, all right? And uh, as we go, we're, gonna, we're going to look at the Passover. And, of course, we're in the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. And Exodus means what? What does Exodus mean? What does Exodus mean? What does Exodus, how do you say Exodus in Hebrew? We ele shemot. And these... We eleshemot, and these names. That's what it is written in Hebrew. Okay? Here's another little thing. All of the Old Testament books that we have in our English Bible are not 
what the Hebrew says. It's what the Greek Septuagint says. Those books are named from the Greek Septuagint, not from the Hebrew Bible. The book of Genesis is Barashith, which means beginnings. And of course, Genesis means beginnings or origin, so that's not too far off. But we get our word Genesis not from Hebrew, but from Greek. You see, I told you we'll never understand the Greek New Testament or the Hebrew Old Testament until you understand Greek and Hebrew. You need those languages are very necessary. At one time, they, uh, well, Baptist said that a pastor that would not study the languages wasn't worthy to get in the pulpit. Forget it. If you really wanted to, uh, uh, if you wanted to have a seminary education, you had to take at least six years of Hebrew and six years of Greek before you got your Ph.D. Most of the time it was doctorate in Bible languages at that time. Now you're a graduate in English Bible only. So they are prey to whatever comes along and whatever commentary they read. In Hebrew and Greek, you don't have to take any commentaries. You can see what it says. You can study for yourself. But it takes a lot of elbow grease and a lot of hard work to do that. And this is a shortcut society, of course. <laughs> I remember when I was working in the hydraulic industry, we repaired everything from hydraulic jacks and all of that stuff. You can't get anybody to repair a hydraulic jack today as throwaways. Everything's throwaway. We have a throwaway society. <laughs> this is the way it is. Shortcuts. Get it made someplace overseas cheap and then bring it and pawn it off on us over here and then we have nobody to go to work and who's going to be the workers? And they even import them from someplace else. 12 and 20. 12 and 20. Exodus. The way out. We Shemot means, uh, and these names, is talking about the names of Jacob's sons. Uh, in uh, Lakota, the book of Exodus is called, how, boy, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. Hatayo, uh, Hatayo the way out. Boy, talk about brain dead. This morning I got up with low blood sugar so bad I could hardly stand up here and I had to drink some, some uh, juice before I could get going. Finally I got to where I knew what I was doing after a little while. Some of the people that told me, they said, well, we couldn't tell any difference. You were lost in the beginning and lost at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Exodus 12 and 20. Exodus 12 and 20. It's having the instructions. Let me read for a few verses here from, New, from uh, the Amplified Bible. From about verse 14 onward. And this day shall be to you for a memorial. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout all your generations and keep it as an ordinance forever. In celebration of the Passover in future years, seven days shall you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first days you put away leaven, symbolic of corruption, out of your houses. For whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a solemn and holy assembly. And on the seventh day there shall be a solemn and holy assembly. No kind of work shall be done in them except preparation of that that which every person must eat, that only may be done by you. Verse number 17, And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day throughout all your generations by an ordinance forever. Verse number 18, In the first of the month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread and continue until the 21st day of the month at evening. All right, seven days, no leaven, symbolic of corruption. What's number, number seven in the Bible mean? You remember, Doris? Who knows what seven? What? Completion. Completion or perfection. Completion or perfection, okay? Seven days, no leaven, symbolic of corruption, shall be found in your houses. Whosoever eats what is leavened shall be excluded from the congregation of Israel, whether a stranger or a native-born person. 
whether a born Jew or someone that became a proselyte. How many proselytes came out of Egypt? Gobs. Lots of them. A lot of those Egyptians were converted during the... By the way, how long, how long did the plagues of Egypt last? Almost a year. Yeah, about a year at least. Some people say two years. At least a year. So there was a whole year of plagues in Egypt. Look over here in the uh, tribulation period. How many years of plagues is it going to be there? Just about seven years of plagues. The last three and a half years are compound plagues. And the plagues are very redundant of what God did in Egypt. You shall eat nothing leavened, and in all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bed during the week. All right, now let's go back to the book of Genesis from Hebrew. And let's have somebody come up here and lead us in prayer before we get started any further. Sharon, you want to come up? Sure. <clears throat> Father, we uh, joyfully and humbly come before you today to learn your word. Um, thank you for the privilege of, of learning under such a wonderful teacher. And Lord, I just ask that you prepare our hearts and our minds so that we can really absorb the depth of your teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Remember Dakota in your prayers this week as she goes to work with... Uh, another co-worker that is a problematic okay all right so remember to code in your prayer she asked me I did forgot to ask you people that this morning and I got lots of trouble so now I asked you okay they can do that all over the world from now on <laughs> all right 12 and 20 call much me set low tokilu be called Mo Mo O Shevatikim Tokilu Mats Sot Mats Sot Matza Matza means what in in Hebrew Matza Yeah bread All right Call all Every leavened, match, metset, unleavened bread, not, not, or leavened, not, ye shall keep on eating in all of your dwelling places. You all shall keep on eating unleavened bread. All during this feast, during this, this how long is it going to last? Huh? Seven days. Seven days, a whole week, a week. And what does a week mean? Finished, completion. The word Sabbath means week. Sabbath means week. All right? It means completion. Wayikra. Moshe. Likal. Signe. Yisrael. Wyomer. Aliham. Mishku. Yukishchu. Lahem. Son, Li Mishpa Cha Tikem. We Shak Kutu. Ha Fa Shak. And he called and kept on calling Moses to all the elders, the, the, the uh, geriatric people. That's what it means, the geriatric people, the old people. The old people, elders. That's from Zok, uh, Zoker. <clears throat> These are old people. In Greek, it's geriatric. That's where we get the word geriatric from. Israel. What does Israel mean? The wrestle with God. Israel. God named Jacob Israel. Jacob means what? What does Jacob mean? You remember? Brother, brother A, what's Jacob mean? 
to follow the hill, just like a dog would follow your heels, to follow the hill. Okay? All right, Jacob, uh, that was his name because he followed Esau. He followed him out and he grabbed a hold of his heel. And God, when, when Jacob wrestled with Jehovah all night long, God said, I'm going to name you Israel. And that's every time that the name it, Jacob is called Israel in the Bible, it means that God is referring to his covenant name with God as his nation. Okay? Israel, one who wrestled with God. Wyomer, and he said and kept on saying unto them, Ali, Ali Ham, unto them, ye pull out, ye pull out, all right, ye pull out. And what it actually means, Mishku, Mishku means to pull up tent stakes, all right, pull up tent stakes, and ye take for yourselves sheep, and for your Li Mishpachotikam, that is a uh, in Greek the term is patria 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 that's what it is in Greek and brother Roger what would this patria mean what would you say when you would see the word patria in Latin it's peter peter get my Greek and Latin mixed up all right. Pater. So, Pater familia. Mishpachot is uh, families. I know that. Okay. But it goes back to the same idea as patria and pater familia. Pater familia. Pater familia is Latin. It's a term. And that means the father of the family. Okay. And patria in Greek means what? the family, but it means the father as the head of the family. Uh, padre in Spanish means father, doesn't it? All right? That's like we get the word patria, the father of the family. And what it means in Hebrew, in all reality, it means uh, semen from one man. Literally, sperm from one man. In other words, we have one man that brought forth this family through him, through his semen, this whole family came into existence. That's literally what it means. And here we have it brought over into these other languages, see? In uh, legal documents, the father of the family would, will, will be pater familia. The pater familia. All right? In Greek, it would be the patria, the father of the family, the head of the family. And here we have the idea of the head of the family. Every one of these elders, we address the elders. Zoker, the elders. The elders were men that were heads of the families. Okay? So every head of the family, every... And, and what is the other term in Greek for this? That's brought over into English. Okay? What is it? Patriarch. That means head father. In all the Old Testament times, it was all the time of the patriarchs. Who were the patriarchs in the Bible? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. All right. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is what we call the time of the patriarchs. The father of the families. Okay? Or the head fathers. And that's who Moses and Aaron are talking to. Is the head of each and every specifically the family, and he's talking to the elders, the really paterfamilia of the families, okay? I don't know if that means anything to you or not, but that's what we're talking about here. And ye shall slaughter the paschal sacrifice. The word paschal there means slaughter. It's a lamb that is slaughtered, Okay? Ye shall slaughter. Literally, when it means ye shall sacrifice, it means you shall slaughter. And the idea is to take a knife and to cut its throat. Humanely. What was the kosher way to slaughter? What's the kosher way to slaughter? What's 
lamb? Okay, well, they would take a, a lamb or a goat or a calf or a bull or a heifer, whatever. Now, this is kind of gruesome, but this is fact. Used to, when I was young, that you went out to the slaughterhouses and you had a shooter. And the shooter shot the animal in the brain. When you shot the animal in the brain, after they shot the animal in the brain, they cut his throat. Okay? They stunned it and they cut his throat. Today, if you go to the grocery store, you're going to find out that the animals that you're buying in the grocery store were shocked and their throats were cut and they were butchered while they were dying. They're dying still when they're butchering them. Okay? They haven't finished dying. That's why you find all the blood in the chicken carcasses and in the beef and in everything that they are slaughtered before they are allowed to even die. They begin the process of slaughtering them because they're in a hurry. Save time and money, of course. Time means money when you're talking about anything like that. In a kosher, in a kosher slaughterhouse, so to speak, they're supposed to take a not a dull knife because they're not going to knock this thing in the head they're not going to shoot it they're not going to stun it but they're going to take it and cut through its jugular vein and they're going to make a slice of, uh, uh, with a sharp knife the knife is going to be sharp and they check the knife a Hebrew rabbi is supposed to check the blade of the knife and they cut the jugular veins on both sides so real fast the animal dies because there's no blood going to his brain and then they pull it up and they let all the blood come out and they catch the blood and they respect the blood of the animal because the life is in the blood. When the blood stops, the animal's lights go out. But that's what we're talking about here. This we have the head of the family. The reason why the head of the family is the head of every family is going to make sure that this animal is slaughtered kosherly. Okay? And that's what was supposed to have been done for a long time. Now, every animal, now they were not allowed to kill any animal at home even during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. All of the animals had to be taken to the tabernacle. If you were going to kill one of your lambs or, or have a dinner feast, you couldn't kill it at home. If you killed it at home, you were guilty of murder. Blood was on your hands because they wanted to make sure that that animal's blood and that animal's life was respected. Okay? Respected. They would take it here and they would cut its throat with a real sharp knife and they would string it up until it's bled out and then you could take your animal home. But they buried the blood. Now, <clears throat> God is getting ready to enforce all that stuff and these are the beginning rules that we're talking about tonight. These are the beginning rules. All right. All right. 1222. Yuli Katem. Agudat. Ezol. Yutivaltem. Badam. Asher. Basaf. Y Hig Gotem L Ha Mash Gof We El Shati Ha Mi Zuzot Men Hadam Asher Basaf We Atem Lo Tisu Ish mepitach bito ad boker. 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 Brother A, boker. <laughs> the day, break of day before the sun comes up. The break of day. When the light breaks over the horizon. That's the break of day. Yuli got him. <coughs> and ye take. This is, uh, well, actually what it says here is ye ha should have taken. 
Let's look at this. And ye will have taken, literally, that second person masculine plural, cal, wow, consecutive perfect. What's wow, consecutive perfect mean? It speaks of something that's going to happen as if it already happened. This is what you're going to do. You're going to do this or else. <laughs> as simple as that. You will do this. All right? A bunch of hyssop. 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 Of hyssop. Now let's look at this hyssop here. It's egg gold. Ezov, that is. Ezov. 23. <coughs> no, that's the wrong one. I, for, I forgot my book. <coughs> I can't look it up. I was going to tell you what it says. Right, maybe I can do that here. See how fast I can do this. <clears throat> Maybe. may get there in a minute. Well, it's, it's not in here like it is in the other book at all. Anyway, what is hyssop, brother uh, Roger? What is a piece of hyssop? I imagine it's some kind of bush. It's a bush. It's a fine bush with uh, fibers on it. Fine bush with fibers on it. And this one here just does not list it like that at all. Anyway, they're going to dip this paintbrush, this paintbrush plant. All right, they're going to dip this paintbrush plant in in blood, and ye will have dipped second person masculine plural cal well consecutive perfect. Ye will have dipped. What would be the word in Hebrew or in Greek for that dipped? What would it be? Baptizo. All right, baptizo. Ye will have dipped immersed in blood. Badam. Look at that word. Badam. In blood, which in basin, in a, a vessel, and ye will have applied, second person masculine plural, if l wow, consecutive perfect, to or unto the lintel, unto, unto, unto the lintel. What is a lintel? What's a lintel? That's what you call a header. A header. Over the door there, there is a header. That is a header up there. So you're going to put it up there first, and then you're going to put some on the right side and one on the left side. Now, what do you think that typifies? This was all a type of something. We even got red here. We want to put some up here, and we're going to put some over here, and we're going to put some over here. What would that typify? The cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is what it typifies. That's the cross. The cross of Christ. In all of your theological ty ty typology books, it's going to tell you this. Okay, so I'm just telling you. How many of you heard that before? Anybody? Anybody heard it before? From you. <laughs> oh, from me. No, okay. Anybody else? Or did you hear it from any place else? You heard. No. Huh? You heard from me. <laughs> I'm the only one? <laughs> Boy. <clears throat> so it it shows the form or the or the shape of the of the cross. If you drive a vertical line and then a horizontal line, 
we have that of a cross, okay? <clears throat> and you dip this paintbrush, basically, paintbrush bush, and you will apply it onto the, the header and onto the doorpost from the blood. Dom means what? Blood. Red. That's what color. What color is really, what color is blood? Blue. Blue. Did you know that? Blood is not red, it's blue. But when oxygen hits it, it is red. Now you knew that, didn't you, Doris? Yeah. Blood is blue in your body. But when oxygen hits it, it turns red. And that's when, and that's what happens. Of course, we don't see any blood, basically, except when oxygen hits it. Okay, so we, it, it, the blue blood, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the blood, Dom. The word Adam comes from that, Adam. Adam means red. That's what his name meant, Adam. Edom, uh, which is Esau, his name meant red because he had red hair, okay? He had red hair all over, actually. He was really a, a hairy character. They named him Harry, okay? And uh, what else? What other word comes from the word red or blood? ha adama. Adama. What's adama? That's the earth that we're related to because we came from the same elements as God created the earth, okay? So all of this is blood. Which in basin and you not, ye shall keep on going out. All right? Once you apply this blood to the doorpost, you will never go out. You go out and you're dead. Now this is a type of something also. What would this be a type of? What would this be a type of? We're just talking about types of the storm now. What you cannot leave, it's not possible to leave once the blood has been applied to the doorpost. In the room is salvation. Outside of the room is damnation. Once the blood has been applied, you are safe. And you're not going to go out. God's not going to let you go out. <laughs> you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what we call security of the believer or preservation of the saints. Calvinism. Calvinism is tulip. What does tulip mean? Tulip. What does that term? You know what tulip means, young lady? What's the T mean? Total hereditary depravity. You got an A plus tonight. Pamela, and then you means what? Total hereditary depravity, that we're all depraved, we're all lost. And then we have the you for what? Unconditional, unconditional election. There's nothing in us that makes God want to save us. All right? God saves us by grace and by mercy, not by anything else. All right? What does the L stand for? We don't believe in that, but what does it stand for? At least I don't. You might believe in that, but I don't. What's that L stand for? Limited atonement that Jesus Christ only died for those that would be saved. That his blood does not cover anybody else, but we know that the Bible teaches otherwise. All right, I means what? Irresistible grace. You got another A+. plus. Twice tonight you got A+. plus. Irresistible grace. That means that if you're a supralapsarian, not an infralapsarian, and not a sublapsarian, do you like those, all those terms? Okay. That you believe that, uh, and you teach, that if God has elected you to salvation, it is an irresistible call, and you cannot resist the call of God. And if you are a primitive Baptist, a primitive Baptist, a particular Baptist, hyper-particular Baptist, <laughs> The, the, the primitive Baptists will do, will do not send out missionaries and they make no evangelistic sermons whatsoever because they said if you are the elect there's nothing in the world going to keep you stop you from coming to church and joining the church you have to do it because God is going to drag you there and that's it you don't have to go out and missionize anybody they're going to come if they're the elect that's what we call irresistible grace 
And then that's where we came to right now. That's what we're studying, preservation of the saints. Once you're in the house and the blood has been applied, you are sealed. You are protected. You will never leave. You cannot go out because if you went out, it would be a violation of Scripture. If you went out that once you have been saved, you then you damned yourself. But you don't do that. So don't do it. Because it's a type of salvation and a type of a person that's been born again. So once you're in the house, once the blood has been applied to the door post and to the header, you're safe and you're saved forever. And it is a violence, it, it is a violation of scriptures to leave because it's going against God's word. Why in the world? If God, Jehovah himself, is going to pass over Egypt and everybody outside of one of these doors, why would you want to go out? Dead is what you'd be, dead. All right. You're learning a little bit from this? All right. Take the blood from the basin, and you shall not keep on going out each man from his house. You can't do that. It's impossible. You can't leave through the opening. By the word, the word ma pitak there, that is a, means door or window or, or open hand. That's what it means. All right. And it's from Chaldee. Daniel 6, 11, uh, and 7 and 10, it talks about the opening of the mouth. Page 637 in Davidson's analytical Hebrew lexicon tells you that. Until the break, odd, that little, uh, that's what we call a, a, a preposition or adverb of time. Until the break of day, Volker. Brother Abe was talking about Volker, the break of day, this morning. 1223 now, 1223. We avar. Hadavar. Linkoff. Et. Mitzrayim. We ra'a. Et. Ha dom, all ha mash gof. We all shati ha mu aha mezuzot. You fa sach ha thavar all ha petak. We lo yeten ha mishit lava el. Ba Tikam Lingof. And he shall have passed over Jehovah. All right. And he shall have passed over third person master singer Cal Wow consecutive perfect. Who's going to pass over Egypt? Who? Jehovah, not the death angel. The death angel did not pass over Egypt. How many times have you ever heard somebody said the death angel passed over Egypt? It didn't happen. The death angel did not pass over Egypt. Jehovah himself. The destroying, the destroying one is what it says in some places, the destroying one. And that's where they might get the idea of the death angel, but the destroying one is the Jehovah that cast everybody in eternal hell fire. This is a type of hell itself. Everything that you see in this, this is talking about salvation and damnation. Without Jesus Christ, without the blood of Jesus Christ, if you're on the outside of the house, you're damned. And you get to go to the eternal hellfire. All right? Not Hades, not Sheol, but eternal state of hellfire forever. All right. And he shall have passed over Jehovah. What does Jehovah mean? I call him Hadavar, which means the Word. In the New Testament, in John 1 and 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. All right? That's what it says in King James. In the Hebrew, or in the Greek, it says, in the Greek Hebraism, it says, In the beginning kept on being the Jehovah. That word should be translated Jehovah there because it's, it's a Hebraism. That's why you have to understand Hebrew before you can understand Greek all the way, and you have to understand Greek before you can understand Hebrew all the way. Jehovah, 
Jehovah is made up of what? Greek word, Hebrew word. What is that there? Hayah. Hayah. What does that mean? To become. To become. On page 224, in Brown Driver Briggs, and 243, in Kohler and Baumgartner. All right? And the name Jehovah, that name right there, is on page 218 and 19 in uh, Brown Driver and Briggs. It's got a long thing. And if you look up in volume number one, about page 185, I believe, in Kohler and Baumgartner, or not Kohler and Baumgartner, Kyle, Kyle and Delish, it'll tell you that this word word in the New Testament is talking about the Ha the Bar or Hashem of the Old Testament, which the Jews today call Adonai. Okay? And he shall have passed over Jehovah to strike. That word Likhoff. What does it say in your translate uh, Doris, what does it say there in yours in verse number twenty three? Twelve twenty three. the destroying one. That is the judgment side of Jehovah. The other morning or the other evening we talked about the uh, the violent side or the rough side of Jesus. This is the rough side of Jehovah. You don't get on you don't want to be on the wrong side of Jehovah. The Jewish nation today is on the wrong side of Jehovah. They still are on the wrong side of Jehovah because they have not accepted who he is. As simple as that. And they're going to get it. <laughs> they're going to get it. To strike Egypt. And he shall have seen the blood on the, what? On the header, or the header over the door, and upon the two doorposts. And he shall have passed over Jehovah, over the door, and he will not keep on giving the spoiling one, the ruining one, to come into your houses to strike you. All right. Yes. This sort of suggests that there's Jehovah and then there's a destroyer. The destroying. And he's not permitting, rather than saying this is all one. But this is the Jehovah side. This is the destroying side of Jehovah. Every time a plague came, the destroying one, the, 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 the judgment side, who is the judge? Who's going to send everybody to hell? Who's going to do it? Jesus. He's the judge. Every lost person, the great white throne judgment right here, he is the judge. And this is a type of him. Judging and killing and striking and destroying. That's who it is. That's the side. Now we see the gentle and meek and mild and lowly Jesus. Don't we? But I'm telling you something. This is Jesus also. And he is the destroying one. And Jesus, the meek and mild Jesus that died for our sins and bled and turned the other cheek is going to be the one that throws lost people into hell forever. Same one. Which side do you want to be on? The destroying one or on Jesus with the blood stains, blood, blood, uh, with the nails prints in his hands and his side and everything? Which one do you want? You can accept that one or you can get the other one. The other one is the destroyer. Do not fear him that can kill your body, but who? Who? He that can destroy your soul forever. Who's that? Jesus. Who's this? Who's the destroying one? It's Jesus. All right. Jesus is the destroying one. 1224. Yushimartem. Ha davar davareth. 
All right. No, et, I mean. What am I doing here? Et, Hadavar, Haze, Lichok, Lika, Yuli, Banika, Odd, Olam. I can't even see straight. <clears throat> Yushimar Tem. And you shall have observed and kept and guarded with your life. You shall have observed and kept and guarded with your life. In Matthew 28 in the New Testament, it has a, a, a term like this. And the word is terio. It's terrain right there. All right? This is the same thing in Greek. All right, let's look at Matthew 28. How many of you have your Greek Bible with you? Nobody? See, you, when you study Hebrew, you got to study Greek. All right, you got your Greek Bible with you, brother Abe? No. Matthew 28. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew 28. Dakota? You got your Bible? Matthew 28, 18. All right. Jesus tells his church that all authority is given to him in heaven and upon the earth. He said, now after you've been kicked out, make disciples from all the nations, baptizing them in the name of in to onama, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. By the way, all of those are singular. In the name, that's singular. How many gods are there? One. We're not talking... Usually, grammatically, if you've got one, two, three, it's plural, isn't it? In the names of. But since we don't have three gods, it's in the name of. That's one thing we need to look. Theologically, even the Bible is correct. Okay? in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to terrain. Terrain. That's the word right there. Terrain. Terrain. To guard with your life. To guard and to keep. All things whatsoever I have commanded to you, and behold, I am with you, I am, all the days until the coming together of the age. That church is going to exist until the end of this age. It didn't go out of existence in the dark ages, nothing. Okay? It didn't quit over there someplace over here somewhere. It didn't die. And it wasn't revived by Joseph Smith, Garner Tad Armstrong, or Martin Luther, or John Calvin. It didn't revive with them, and there did die. Because Jesus said it wouldn't. It would have a rough time, I can guarantee you that much. And ye shall have observed and guarded the word. All right? The word, the this. What word is this? This is an edict. In the New Testament, it calls Jesus the word when it's, talk, when it's a Hebraism, but sometimes it talks the Bible, talks about the Bible as the word. And this is the same thing here as a written word. You shall guard the words, the edicts, the plans. Because all these plans in here that we're getting right now are, are types and sometimes double types. So they're very important, aren't they? If it's a type, it's very important. Here we have the blood of, on the header and on the doorpost. And if you put a deal through there, you've got the cross of Christ. And when you go in there, you can't leave. Because if you leave, it would be a type of your losing your salvation, which can't be done. You can't lose your salvation because you didn't get it in the first place. God gave it to you. Right? Isn't that beautiful type? Every one of these things are types. The word that this, it is a prescribed and written for you and for your sons until forever. Until forever. It's going to be forever. In eternity past, God will be teaching us what this meant back there. Now I can stand up here in front of you and I can teach you the types and, and the added types and everything you can think of. But we're going to be learning in more depth. I try to go in great depth. I try to teach people some deep things. But I'm only a grammar I'm only a kindergarten teacher. 
They talk about our classrooms, the classes that I teach. Oh, that's the brainy bunch. You know, they call the Brady bunch. These, we are the brainy bunch. We're the ones that's all these smart people, you know, and, and all the missionaries and the, and the pastors and whatever, you know, they come from the classes. Even the, gonna, even the ones that are going to be preachers, Brother Abe, <laughs> they come to the class. And that they feel the calling of God, and they get so excited. I had a retired preacher come to my class, my Greek class, for years and years. Well, about two or three years he was in my class. And if you go listen to the early ones in First and Second Peter and, and the book of Revelation and uh, different ones in the early classes, you will hear him in there. And he gets so excited, and he's just jumping up and down. By the end of the class, he's so excited, just, ah, 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 i got to go tell somebody. I gotta talk. I gotta shed it. I gotta share it. I gotta go do it. He had retired, taking it easy. After two or three years of my class, he decided he couldn't retire anymore. He was so filled up with God's word. He said, "I never saw anybody could just get up and preach from Greek and Hebrew like you do. You just take it and you preach from it. Just from that." He said, "I just learned so much." He said, "I never got that in the seminary before. I had the English, English Bible." English Bible, and here I have learned so much and so depth. But I got news for you: we're just beginning. When Jesus sits down and tells you, and when you sit at His feet, or Abraham, or Isaac, or Jacob, Moses, you're go they're going to go much deeper than me. I just got a little door open. They're going to open up all the other doors and tell you all the different things and what every syllable meant and everything. It's going to be wonderful. We're in grammar school. We're just in grade school. We're just in kindergarten. We're just in preschool. That's what we are. But let's don't try to stay there and suck the bottle forever. Go on and learn these things. This is exciting. It's exciting to me. Our classrooms ought to be filled plumb up. You shall do this forever. Forever. In the eternity future, we are going to be learning this. In eternity future. 1225, 1225. Brother Abe, you get that? Forever. Guard it with your life. It's very important. We haya ki tovo el haaritz asher yeten hadavar lekem kaeshur deber yushi martem et haavada hazot. And it shall have become when ye continue to come into, you keep on coming into the land. They're going to go on, they're going to keep on. Second person, master, and plural, cal, imperfect. When you keep on coming into the land, which he will keep on setting, Jehovah. To you all, just as he has spoken, ye shall have watched and guarded and deserved the service. The this. This very thing, this very service, this very celebration, you will keep on guarding it from now on. This is the first time they're going to keep the Passover, but they're going to keep it for a long, long time. What, what festival? What feast will Israel in the millennium? Now we're talking about jumping way ahead. God isn't finished with Israel yet, even though Israel is in direct violation of God's laws today and everything else. And God's going to pound them to, to a pulp. He's going to kill two out of every three of them. That's what's going to happen. He's going to do this. The Bible tells us that. But God's got a plan for them still. He, in his economy, he has a place for Israel. Okay, And for 1,000 years, they're down on this earth. They're going to be doing things that remind us of what happened in the wilderness, what happened in Egypt, how God called out Abraham, all this. What feast are they going to be observing there? So Passover? No, no not the Passover. Passover's done. It's a done thing. Okay. But what, what would they? Now let's put our thinking hats on. Brother Abe, you got your thinking hat on? Get that thinking hat on. If 
what feast, what feast typified the tabernacle? What feast typified something that will last forever? What feast? God built the tabernacle because he wanted to what? Why did God build the tabernacle? He wanted to dwell with his people. What feast typifies God's dwelling and God's provision? Sabbath. The Feast of Booths. The Feast of Tabernacles. God provided for them. Out, and what do they do in the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths? The Sukkot. What do they do? They build the little hut. They build a hut out of things that God provided. Nothing man-made. It's all got to be natural. They have to use limbs. They have to use... Everything's got to be natural. If they use any cord to do it, it's got to be natural cord. And they, and they bind this tabernacle together. And what do they cover it with? Palm branches and branches that God provided because God made the palm tree. They didn't have to make the palm tree. They didn't have to go out and, and drill for oil and, and, and make plastic and, and make roofs and, and do all this kind of stuff out of material. But we're making something out of material that God made because God provided the material. Okay? And so they would have palm branches and limbs off of trees that God made. How many ever made a tree? Anybody ever make a tree? Nobody can make a tree. You can't make a tree. All right? It can't be done. Only God can make a tree. So they take all of these natural things, and what do they hang around? What do they hang around? The fruits and vegetables that God provided in the land are hung all around there. And what this derives is that God has watched over us all of this time. And for a thousand years on this earth, God will provide. And everything that they used in the Feast of Tabernacles there, God will have provided again. There won't have to be another Passover. There won't have to be another thing. But God wants to remind us that he has provided for us always. God provides for you. He provides. Okay. Let's go back and look at some of the things. Unto the land the hodrets, when you get into the land, and you keep on sitting there, Jehovah keeps on sitting in your land, to you all, look at that little uh, preposition with a suffix behind it. See, they have a preparation, lamet there, with a cough and mem behind it, and that's second person masculine plural, page 429 in Davidson's, that lick him. And then ka ashur, we have ki and we have ashur. We have a particle of relation, and we have key in front of it. That's a combined word. Just as he has spoken, second, third person masculine singular, PL perfect. PL stem means what? Intensifies. He has violently spoken, forcefully spoken. God said, do this. You go in that house, you put that blood there, and you don't walk out. Because it's a type of salvation. You can't get lost. You walk out of that door, and it's going to violate my principles. See? Violate my principles. My word. Do violence to the word of God. And ye shall keep on guarding the service, the labor, the this. All right, 1226. 1226, and we'll quit there. We went from 1220 to 26. That's six verses. We've been going six verses a night. But there's a lot of theology in here, isn't there? Is that more important than chasing rabbits in Hebrew sometimes? Isn't it? <laughs> All right. We haya, ki, yomeru, alakam, benakam, ma, ha abada. Hazot lechem. And ye shall have become when they keep on saying unto ye, you all your you are all your sons, what 
the service of this to you. Now this is the question, isn't it? In, this, uh, in the Passover today, they have the youngest child ask the question, why are we doing this? And then they will do what? They will explain the whole Passover. And this is the question that it's talking about here when they ask you this question. When they ask you this question. And then you shall tell them that God took us out of slavery. Our hands were bound. We were bound in slavery. We were, we were slaves in, in Egypt. And Egypt is a type of what? The world. Egypt is a type of the world. We were bound in slavery in Egypt. And God freed us. And God provided for us. And he loved us. And he saved us. And his presence passed over Egypt. And all those on the outside of the houses that had the blood on the header and on the doorpost Everyone was damned. Everyone outside of Christ has no protection. The presence of God, the destroying one, which is Jehovah himself, will cast them into the eternal lake of fire. Aren't you glad you saved, Pamela? You don't ever have to worry about being saved because you can't ever leave the house. You can't go outside. It would do violence to the eternal word of God. It's beautiful. Security of the believer. Yes. Okay, because it was all the firstborn of Egypt mm -hmm. who died. Yeah. Well, what about a newborn baby? They haven't done anything. No. And they're not in hell. Or, uh, no. I mean, the God took them to heaven, right? That's right. They got to go to heaven. If they'd have grown up, they'd have probably gone to hell. Like Brother Madden used to say, all them, them, all them Muslim babies. <laughs> He'd say, all them Muslim babies, all them Catholic babies. If they die, they're going to go to heaven. And God's going to get the glory. He said, heaven's going to be more people than that than there is hell. And just think about it. How many little children have died in, in all the history of mankind? How many have died? Every one of them is with the Lord. That really populated heaven good. Now, if you're Mormon and you lost a child, uh, you get to have that child again in heaven and raise it. Now, that's kind of weak. Pablum compared to what the Word of God says. That child is saved forever. And just in heaven, you get to meet the child if you're there in heaven too. That's real good. All right, do you have any other questions? We went through 12, 20 through 26. Brother Abe, you got a question? What? Say that real slowly and plainly again. Why the firstborn died? Because God claims every life, the opening of the womb, is his. And all the way through the whole nation of Israel, every, every calf that was born was a firstborn calf. It was God's. It's God's calf because I gave it life, and it's mine. You could redeem it with something else, but it had to be redeemed. A donkey you could not sacrifice a donkey. And just look at it this way. It's, it's, it's trusting. When you tithe, what do you do? You trust God that he will multiply your money, even though you don't have enough to tithe. All right? You just keep on doing it. You just keep on doing it. And you trust God. How about if you're a farmer... And you lived in the land of Israel, in the Palestine. And you had the, the feast of first fruits was what? You took the fer, very first fruits that were ripe in your field and you took all of it to God and gave it to him. What happened if a plague of locusts came and hail and thunder and lightning? What happened if your field caught on fire with lightning and burned all up? What did you do when you took the first fruits to, fruits to God? You trusted God that he would protect and give you the rest. That's what you do. And that's what you do when you, when you make offerings to God. You trust God that he's going to take care of you. You just trust him that's going to take care of you. You know, 
keeping up the websites is impossible financially to me. I live below the poverty level, f a fact. It's impossible for me to do that. And it's real hard because we don't get many offerings at all. It's, it's impossible to do it. If you looked at what I get and how much it talks, costs to record every class, it used to be a lot more. It was like $35 for every class. And you just go look at how many classes are, are out there. Thousands. All of them cost $35 a piece for a long time. How did I get it? Where did it come from? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I've done it. I don't know how on earth that I've done it. But God has provided. Somehow he's provided. And he's kept it out there. Because I know one thing, that God is using that. We've got people in China. We've got people in India. We've got people in Russia. We've got people in the Middle East that are listening to our classes and watching our classes that they can't get any place else in the world. I get emails and stuff from these people. They say, this is not taught anywhere else at all. You're the only one doing this. And when I look at that, and I just keep, you know, getting money to come to church is very difficult to buy gasoline. I'm just laying this out to you. But this is a type of something. This is a type of the Feast of Tabernacles. They remembered that God provided everything. He gives you life. I should have died at least 12 years ago, if nothing else. I mean, a thousand times in my life I faced death. And I could have gone all of those times. But 12 years ago, or 13 years ago, I got cancer. And they made a lot of mistakes with me. And they really goofed up, and they really damaged me greatly. And I still just get here, falling down sometimes. This morning I had low blood sugar so bad I could hardly stand up here. I drank juice before I got up and started preaching. I didn't know what I was doing almost when I stood up, really. Brother Roger, you know what I felt like. I think you could see it, couldn't you? I was in bad shape. I started down that grape juice real, f or well, cranberry grape juice real fast to try to, where I could keep on. I could have just laid down and sat down and said, get somebody else. But you know something? That was a very important sermon that I preached. The one that I preached last Wednesday night, they hit that thing like, whoof! In the less than 24 hours, 100 people on sermon audio had downloaded that. In less than 24 hours. And it's just gone ever since. That was called the volatative quality of creation. And most of you were here. I just thought it was just another sermon. But boy, did they like it. And you know what? It was difficult for me to get here, but I did it. You just stick your neck out on the line. I had such fantastic teachers, some of the greatest teachers in the world in 2,000 years. They were like Peter and Paul. My teachers were. D.S. Madden, Martin Kahneman, those people. Martin Kahneman would come to, to teach in the seminary when he was dying with heart trouble. I stood up here and whammo, 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 my heart hurting me so bad. When I went home from church today, my heart hurt so bad, I just couldn't hardly stand it. I couldn't hardly eat or anything, I hurt so bad. And uh, I come. You know why? Because I watched Martin Kahneman do it. Martin Kahneman would go into the hospital with heart arrhythmia. It was so bad that he was dying. Cardiac arrest. And fibrillation. And his wife would go pick him up in the hospital and he wouldn't let her take him home. He said, take me to the seminary. My next class is in 15 minutes. He'd get in there and sit down there and you'd hear him coughing all through because he had congestive heart failure. He's coughing all through the class. You can go listen to him preach dying on my website. Go look up Dr. Martin Van Buren Kahneman on there. You go listen to him. Listen to him. Dr. Carl E. Farrar, Farrar, if you want to name, pronounce his name like that. He had multiple, multiple dystrophy. All of his life from five, time, five years old, he should have died a thousand times. And he came there crippling along and sat there and boy would the words of God flow from this little midget of a person so crippled up he could his hands were like this when he'd write he put his little hands up just barely could get them up to his glasses and go like that with them. 
but he was there every time. I was his substitute teacher when he couldn't make it. <laughs> Lots of stuff happened to him, just unbelievable catastrophes of, of ailments. One day he was sitting there eating lunch and his guts busted over and his guts just started emptying right there. He had had so many operations on his stomach and everything. Had to put a colostomy on him and he would have that the rest of his life. He said a lot better. <laughs> better your guts breaking and coming through all the scar tissue. I saw these teachers teach like that. It gives us examples. Jesus on the cross of Calvary dying was preaching, wasn't he? Preaching. All right. We ought to, if God could give you the last breath, let's do it. Let's use that last breath doing something for him, doing something eternal that will follow us into the heavens. And I've gone way too far tonight. But that is the reason for our lives. Our reason for our lives is to serve him, not ourselves. And you can give beyond your means way beyond your means and God's going to provide somehow he will get somebody to to help you to help you I'm supporting a missionary right now that don't have any place to stay don't have any food to eat or anything else but I do it for him I've been supporting those Solomon Islands people down there those people uh, Brother Morley went down there and he didn't establish missions he established churches and then when he established a church that means that you're self-supporting the reason why people have missions for 20 and 30 and 40 years is because they need support. And if they say we're a church, they won't get it. But he established churches and then trusted God because he did it right. That's the right way to do it. You don't establish, you Show me in, in the Bible where you establish a mission. You establish churches. Okay? But if you have a mission, then you can get mission work. All of my adult life, just about I have supported the Solomon Island mission because it was established correctly. Theologically correct. Scripturally. And they needed support. I give them money when I could keep it. But I give it to them anyway. <laughs> we do things. We give sometimes when... And we look ahead. That's what all of these feasts and things... All of this stuff teaches us walk by faith. Faith is the biggest part of the Christian walk. Faith is the biggest part of the Christian life. By faith, you do what you do. By faith, you get up when you don't feel like it and go there. By faith, you know you can't afford it, but you get enough gasoline in the car that you go and you get there. That's by faith. You, by faith, you do all these things. That's why you do it. By faith. You're saved by faith. And where do you get the faith? It's a gift of God. All right. But remember that. And whatever you do, remember the faith. Remember the gift. And remember God will help you through it. God will help you through it. He'll help you walk the walk. You just got to take the first step. Take the first step. Well, let's have a word of prayer and go out and uh, attack the world with God's word. Attack it. Dakota, you want to come up here and dismiss us in prayer? No, I didn't think you did. Brother Abe. <laughs> I'm, I'm in trouble now. Come on, Brother Abe. <laughs> I just wanted to wake her up real good. Oh, yeah. She's heard me preach all her life. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for night you gave us wonderful uh, lecture and you gave us the wisdom you procured before the world created through the Bible which uh, be with uh, Dr. Phillips and everybody in this class and who are listening this class all over the world or in people who eagerly uh, want to study follow your, your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, all of you.